Austerlitz is my favorite battle of all time. I've grown an uh, interest for it for almost 30 years. And in my mind, it's very high. It's uh, with the likes of, I guess, Kanai, Gogameles, Leutzen. For me, there's something absolute with Austerlitz, both in the build-up, uh, in the actual battle, and afterwards in the myth that still surrounds it. So now that you're warned, let's have a look at Epic History TV on this battle. The Great Courses Plus. In December 1804, in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself Emperor. And one funny thing about this here is Napoleon's mother. Thus, she was not here for his son's coronation because she wasn't pleased about it. And I guess so much for historical accuracy for of the French. Europe had never seen such a sudden and dramatic rise to power. A son of impoverished Corsican nobility to military dictator of France in little more than 10 years. Dictator of France, I maintain that I don't agree with that. At least, I don't see how it's more despotic than the other monarchs of this era. Revolution and war had cleared Napoleon's path to the throne. War would dominate his ten-year reign. A conflict unprecedented in history that would leave millions dead and a continent in turmoil. Eight months after Napoleon's coronation, the French Empire and its Spanish ally were at war with Britain, and Napoleon had assembled an army of 180,000 men along the Channel coast. But as long as the British Royal Navy ruled the seas, Invasion was impossible, but nor could Britain challenge France on land. And so British Prime Minister William Pitt tried to build a European coalition against Napoleon, using diplomacy and gold. And that's impressive how much money they are going to be able to invest to take Napoleon down. Britain would prove Napoleon's most steadfast enemy, and its press delighted in relentless mockery of the French Emperor. Britain and France were old rivals, in Europe and overseas. But now, Pitt feared Napoleon's conquests had made France too powerful. The French Emperor had to be defeated, and Europe's balance of power restored if there was ever to be lasting peace. Pitt found willing allies in Europe, among monarchs who despised Napoleon as a product of the French Revolution and a dangerous threat to the existing order. Austria harboured the deepest grievances, having seen her influence in Germany and Italy steadily eroded by French victories. The final straw came in May 1804, when Napoleon had also crowned himself King of Italy in Milan. Austria, Russia, Sweden and Naples joined Britain in an alliance known as the Third Coalition, and devised an ambitious plan for a series of joint offensives against France. The main attack would be made by a combined Austro-Russian army, advancing across the Rhine into France. But Napoleon got word of their plans and reacted with typical speed and decision. He was determined to strike first, before the Allies could join forces, and ordered his army always keep the initiative, now renamed La Grande Armée, to march to the River Rhine. His target was the Austrian army of General Mack, which had made a premature advance against Bavaria, a French ally and was now dangerously isolated from the other Allied armies. 
Napoleon ordered Marshal Murat, his famously flamboyant cavalry commander, to make feint attacks through the Black Forest, while the rest of his army, advancing at speed, enveloped Mack's army from the north. That summer, Napoleon's Grande Armée was at its most formidable. Well-trained, highly motivated, its regiments at full strength. What's more, it had been newly reorganised according to the Corps system, later imitated by virtually every army in the world. Each corps, commanded by a marshal, was a mini-army of 15 to 30,000 soldiers, with its own infantry, cavalry, artillery and supporting arms, such as reconnaissance, engineers and transport. This you have the whole Avengers team with uh, all Napoleon's best marshals, and something all these guys share in common, like Napoleon, they started very low, I guess most of them were commoners and they made it to the, to the top ranks of the army. And for example, one striking case is Murat. So Murat is in charge of the cavalry. The cavalry is traditionally preempted by the nobles. It's the, the most uh, prestigious arms within the French army. And Murat is like the 11th son of an innkeeper and he takes the head of the most prestigious arm of the French army. It meant each corps could march and fight for a limited time independently. Oh, and we, I guess we have one uh, guest that uh, we kind of forget while thinking about the marshal is uh, the, the, the key of this whole system is, the, is Berthier, the head of staff of Napoleon. And this guy was able to understand Napoleon's directives and uh, traduct it into practical orders so, so that everything can perfectly like coordinate. This meant each corps could march and fight for a limited time independently, allowing Napoleon to break with the old doctrine of keeping his army concentrated and advance with his corps widely dispersed. This helped to disguise his real objective and increased movement speed, because the army could advance along multiple roads and live off the land, taking its supplies from scattered villages, rather than relying on slow-moving supply wagons. When the enemy's main force was located, the army could quickly concentrate for battle. This is how Napoleon's army was able to move at a speed that often surprised and disorientated his enemies. Mack didn't realise the danger he was in until it was too late. Napoleon's fast-moving corps crossed the Danube behind him and surrounded his army. And see here, just by walking and manoeuvring, Napoleon's army surrounds and basically destroys one uh, Austrian army. And it is said that most of Napoleon's campaigns were won by its soldiers' shoes. Mack launched a series of poorly coordinated counter-attacks. But despite some desperate fighting, the Austrians couldn't break out of the trap. Mack hoped that Kutuzov's Russian army could arrive in time to save him. But the Russians were still 160 miles away. And so, at Ulm, on the 19th of October, just six weeks into the war, Mack surrendered his army to Napoleon. The French took nearly 60,000 Austrian prisoners, and Napoleon had struck his first devastating blow against the coalition. Russian General Mikhail Kutuzov was an experienced and wary commander, more cautious than Mack. Cautiousness will allow him to crush Napoleon in the Russian campaign. And yeah, what, what do you do in front of a superior enemy looking for a decisive engagement? 
you just deny it. His army was exhausted after its 900-mile march from Russia. But hearing of the Austrians' surrender at Ulm, and knowing he wasn't strong enough to face Napoleon alone, he immediately ordered a retreat. Napoleon pursued. The Russians fought several sharp rearguard actions, but could not save the Austrian capital, Vienna, which the French occupied on the 12th of October. Kutuzov slipped away to Olmutz in today's Czech Republic, where he was joined by reinforcements, as well as Emperor Alexander of Russia and Emperor Francis of Austria in And now we have three emperors. person. Napoleon was furious that Kutuzov had escaped. By now his army was also exhausted, and far from home, with winter approaching. He needed to force a decisive battle, quickly. Fortunately for him, the overconfident 27-year-old Russian Emperor sought the glory of battle, overriding the concerns of his veteran commander, General Kutuzov. And Napoleon is going to perfectly understand it and play on Alexander's impulsiveness. He'll order, for example, his cavalry to faint retreat the moment they encounter the Allies. Then he'll meet a Russian envoy and he will manage to give him a very terrible impression. He'll look haggard, tired, desperate, like incoherent. And this envoy will come back to uh, the Allied H quarter and he'll report this and it's going to feed Alexander's overconfidence. With the Allied army closing in, Napoleon ordered his corps to rapidly concentrate on a battlefield he had carefully selected, near the town of Austerlitz. Napoleon oversaw the dispositions of his army late into the night, then grabbed a few hours sleep beside a campfire. And as mentioned, so we are in the night between the 1st and the 2nd of December, just one year after Napoleon's coronation. And this night is going to be legendary. Its soldier will fire lights all over the French camp in order to celebrate the birthday of the coronation and shout all night long, Vive l'Empereur. At this point, the army is over-motivated and eager to give Napoleon a great victory. Dawn would mark the first anniversary of his coronation as emperor, and promised a battle that would make or break his young empire. The morning of the 2nd of December 1805 was cold and bright with a heavy mist. Two armies of near equal size faced each other across a seven mile wide battlefield. But the Allies held the high ground of the Pratzen Heights, while French Third Corps under Marshal Davout was still marching to the battlefield. Seeing Napoleon's thinly stretched right flank, the Allies planned a large-scale attack from the Pratzen Heights to st And here you, you can notice a perfect coherence with Napoleon's strategy to give the Allies a false sense of superiority. He leaves them the superior strategic position with Pratzen high ground and he baits them with a weak right flank. Steamroller the French right, before swinging round to envelop Napoleon's army. Little did they know, Napoleon was counting on his weak right wing luring the Allies into just such a move. Whereupon he would launch his own attack on the Pratzen Heights to cut the Allied army in half. His bold plan relied on his correct prediction of Allied movements, the speedy arrival of Davout's Third Corps on his right, and a perfectly timed counter-attack. The battle began around 7am, 
as Austrian troops of General Keinmayr's advance guard clashed with French troops defending the village of Telnitz. In the face of overwhelming odds, the French fought stubbornly and bravely, but gradually they were forced back. But the Allies, instead of carrying out their great enveloping attack, did nothing. The morning mist and the late arrival of orders had led to confusion and delay. And don't forget that here we are talking about a very big battle on, like mentioned, seven miles with poor communication and poor weather. So it's very hard to coordinate its forces. And it was another hour before the first three Allied columns were on the move. Soon, fierce fighting erupted around Sokolnitz village and castle. Marshal Davout's corps, which had just force-marched 70 miles in two days, now arrived to strengthen the French right wing. Around 9am, his lead infantry brigade appeared suddenly through the mist and retook Telnitz before being driven back in turn by Austrian hussars. Two more of Davout's brigades reinforced French troops at Sokolnitz. As the mist... We can see the problem for the Allies. So, on the right flank, uh, they are trying to attack Napoleon's best tactician, uh, Maréchal Davout, whose nickname is the Iron Marshal, so uh, good luck with trying to break this guy. And here you can see that the central position of the Allies, this positive, is very, very weak. And at, at this point, it's like game over for the Allies. Mist began to clear. Napoleon saw that, as he'd hoped, the Allied left was moving off the Pratzen Heights and he ordered Marshal Soult's 4th Corps to begin its attack. To the alarm of Allied commanders, two French infantry divisions, until now hidden by the mist, were suddenly seen advancing straight towards the Allied centre. General Kutuzov was forced to hurriedly organise a defence of the heights, using troops of four column. Two hours of bloody fighting followed. Musket fire was so rapid and furious that both sides were soon low on ammunition and turned to the bayonet. By 11am, the French, with the advantage in training and discipline, had secured the heights and driven a deep wedge into the Allied position. To the north, a giant cavalry battle developed. While a Russian force from General Bagration's advance guard captured the village of Bosenitz before it was halted by cannon fire from the Santon Hill. A decisive charge by six regiments of French heavy cavalry finally drove back the Allies, allowing Marshal Lannes' V Corps to move forward and seize Blasowitz and Krug. Now, Grand Duke Constantine, commanding the Russian Imperial Guard, led forward this last Allied reserve in a desperate bid to reclaim the Pratzen Heights. A battalion of the French 4th Line Regiment was charged down by Russian Guard cavalry, losing its eagle standard in bloody fighting. Napoleon, who'd moved up to the heights, sent in his own guard cavalry. In this grim melee between the elite horsemen of both armies, the French finally prevailed. This cavalry charge is going to be furious. Uh, Napoleon's Imperial Guard is going to go berserk. And you have one famous example, I don't know if it's true, one Mamluk who serves in Napoleon's Imperial Guard uh, allegedly comes back seven times with an enemy standard and show it to the emperor. Then Napoleon begs him not to uh, to return to the battle, but 
The Mamluk goes back and this time he never comes back. Napoleon had broken the Allied centre. Now, to close the trap on the Allied left wing, still locked in heavy fighting around Sokolnitz. Around 2pm, Napoleon ordered four divisions to swing south and cut off their retreat. General Buxhauden, commanding the Allied left, only now saw the danger he was in. Attacked from three sides, the only escape was south. Many of his troops were forced to flee across frozen ponds. French artillery opened fire, trying to smash the ice with their cannonballs. About 200 men and dozens of horses drowned in the freezing water. But not the many thousands of Napoleon's propaganda. The French Emperor had won a brilliant victory. His army had taken more than 10,000 prisoners and captured 45 enemy standards. Thousands of dead and wounded of all sides littered the battlefield. Many left untended for days. The Battle of the Three Emperors, as it became known, was a crushing blow to the Third Coalition. As Russian forces retreated back to Russia, Francis I of Austria was forced to accept a humiliating settlement with France. And here is the, the shadow in the painting. Napoleon does not know how not to humiliate an enemy when he signs a peace treaty. If you humiliate him and drives him into a desperate situation, at the first occasion, he'll take arms and try to fight you again and again. Agreeing to pay a 40 million franc indemnity and give up more territory in exchange for peace. But meanwhile, news had reached Napoleon of a disastrous Franco-Spanish defeat at sea off Cape Trafalgar. British Admiral Lord Nelson, at the cost of his own life, had masterminded a victory so complete that it ensured British naval dominance, not just for the rest of the war, but for the next 100 years. Britain, master of the sea. Napoleon, unbeatable on land. The whale and the elephant, neither able to challenge the other in its own domain. When William Pitt received news of Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz, he's supposed to have said, roll up that map of Europe, it will not be wanted these 10 years. And 10 years is almost uh, exact. It'll, Napoleon will fall 10 years after that. A month later, Pitt was dead. But his warning that Europe faced another 10 years of war and upheaval was to prove prophetic. So, I, I guess that's it for this video. Honestly, I very much enjoyed it. Uh, let me know in the comments what you thought of my analysis. And talk to you soon. Bye.